It's my pleasure to introduce Jean R. Nickel. Jean Nickel is a law professor, commentator, and author of Indecent Assembly, the North Carolina Legislature's Blueprint for the War on Democracy democracy and equity, which was published by Blair in 2020, and also the faces of poverty in North Carolina, stories from our invisible citizens. He was director of the UNC Poverty Center until it was closed by the UNC Board of Governors for publishing articles critical of the then governor and General Assembly. Since 2015, Jean's research has been supported by the North Carolina Poverty Research Fund, and tonight he's here to talk with us about his new book, Lessons from North Carolina, Race, Religion, Tribe, and the Future of America. Welcome, Jean. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate those kind words, and it's, it's lovely to be here, even if it's uh, virtual uh, at Malaprops, which I, I was explaining uh, a little earlier is, uh, I've, I've been spending a lot of time in North Carolina bookstores the last uh, three weeks, and uh, North Carolina has a lot of great independent bookstores. Mallow Props is one of my favorites. It is the coolest bookstore in North Carolina, so uh, let me just echo what Stephanie said about these, your support of these independent book uh, sellers uh, and kind of treasures uh, around North Carolina. I uh, wish that I was in Asheville, which is a marvelous place, uh, but I'm in another marvelous place here, here for a couple of days. And so I appreciate the chance to get to talk. This uh, new book is the, it's odd, this is the third book that I've written in the last five years dealing one way or another with North Carolina public policy and the and its challenges. Uh, uh, I don't know what that says that I can't seem to get off the topic. Uh, maybe I've got a, a lousy sense of humor or I'm a sucker for punishment. Uh, uh, I don't know. But uh, the way I explained it to someone the other day is my uh, employer, the University of North Carolina, has spent so much time and effort trying to stop me from saying things about public policy in North Carolina that I can't seem to shake it. I, so I'm, I guess I'll continue. I, I do uh, uh, try to let people know that this new book is dedicated to the University of North Carolina Board of Governors with my great uh, affection. And a little shout out to Phil Berger, who uh, gets uh, probably some special attentions uh, here. I'm going to talk about this book for uh, 20, 25, 30 minutes, maybe um, uh, do something like a reading, but uh, it's uh, probably a bit different than that, taken from different parts of the book. And then I look forward to us getting to have a conversation. I know uh, uh, that uh, Buncombe County folks like to have a question or two, and uh, I look forward to that. So. Uh, I'll uh, start sort of explaining what the book is about. Over the past dozen years, North Carolina, which traditionally has been seen as a moderate beacon of Southern progress, has embraced a vivid and trailblazing war on democracy, on equality, and constitutional law. Our crusade against electoral fairness, against people of color, against poor people, against LGBT folks, against women, public schools and universities and independent courts has been broadly understood to be pathbreaking. It's what the New York Times calls North Carolina's pioneering work in bigotry. I don't know that that's the brand we were after or the Atlantic just said the other day that North Carolina is a warning to the United States. Uh, so you get the point. And those warning lessons are ones that uh, I'm going to spend some time talking about in this book and this evening. In thinking about uh, how to do this, it's hard to tell where to start. I sort of, it made me think of what Lily Tomlin said a few uh, years ago, no matter how cynical I get, I can't seem to keep up and that pretty much uh, applies to us here, I think. But in truth, 
In North Carolina, looking at our history and our present, you can almost always figure out where to begin. That's the question of race. From our first day as a colony until this very morning, race isn't everything in North Carolina, but when it comes to mauling democracy and casting aside the meaning and mission of America, you can always turn first to race in the Tar Heel State. And so I'll do that, beginning by saying since 2010 here, when our most times all white, or at least extremely racially segregated Republican caucuses have repaired to their closed door meetings to craft the laws for the state of North Carolina, meetings that even Republican lawmakers call sessions of, quote, the old white man's club. These legislators have given us the largest, most pervasive racial gerrymanders ever seen in the United States, the harshest voter suppression laws enacted by any state in the last half century, the greatest, most distorting political gerrymanders in American history. They've used surgical precision to make it harder for black people to vote. North Carolina Republicans have been caught, the courts tell us repeatedly, with the smoking gun, repeatedly embracing racial discrimination to disenfranchise their enemies. They repealed the Racial Justice Act. They responded to the Black Lives Matter movement by making it harder to get access to police video, harder you can imagine. They've invented special new criminal penalties for black demonstrators as they've welcomed AK-15s for angry white protests. And now, of course, you know, they have the nerve to tell us what we can and can't learn about our racial history after, of course, they passed a law lionizing Confederate memorials explaining that the Civil War wasn't actually about slavery. It was only about tyrannous Northern tariffs. Lincoln was wrong, apparently. These Tar Heel Republicans were right. The North Carolina's General Assembly's Republican governing caucuses not only look like a white people's assembly, they govern like one, and they're apparently proud of it. And they've shown us in the last 12 years that once you cast aside the central purpose of America, what Lincoln said was our defining cause, liberty to all, once you cast aside that in one arena, it becomes easier in the next and the next. Breaking the compact becomes contagious, imperialistic, viral. So what they've done in race, they would do again in religion imposing a regime of white evangelical Christianity on everyone else, a regime that is neither democratic nor humane, nor least of all Christian. They've launched one of the nation's most aggressive and most hypocritical crusades against poor people, as if low-income Tar Heels could acceptably be deemed strangers to the Commonwealth, the disappeared, the invisible, the despised. And we've added withering new battlefronts against gays and lesbians, against women now picking up speed before our eyes, against the public schools, public universities, the courts, the rule of law and democracy itself. And today, as you know, they relentlessly aim their venom against transgender folks, especially kids, their latest targets, as they search time and again for our most vulnerable members, as if cruelty itself could be a defining political principle. All this began to unfold here in North Carolina, even before Donald Trump launched his long for marriage of The Handmaid's Tale and The Hunger Games, creating here what many states have deemed the quote, North Carolina playbook. It's clear as well what our common theme has been, how we've done it, our unstated but persistent creed 
That's the compelling notion that some of us count and others don't, or at least some count a lot more than others do. We've said systematically, organically, that some of us are the full members, the real tribe, the owners, the chosen, the full Americans, while others may be allowed to enter or to remain, but they're actually like tenants or passers through. They exist here at the main folks' sufferance. The real tribe might tolerate them a little bit, but that's the most that can be asked. If our creeds and constitutions seem to demand more, which they do, to demand equal dignity and opportunity and full membership and participation, then those creeds and constitutions will simply have to go. They'll have to be discarded, despite all the blood and sweat and sacrifice spent in their cause. These longstanding commitments will have to give way. We believe in democracy here only as long as we're guaranteed to win. We believe in equality only so long as our own dominance is assured. So it's not only necessary that we beat our adversaries at the ballot box or on the state house floor, we need to disqualify them, to exclude them, to handicap their participation. It's liberty for our folks and submission for the rest. Equal justice under law in Carolina carries that damning, disqualifying asterisk. There's much to regret in this dozen year long battle against democracy in the Tar Heel State. First, constitutional lawyers on both the right and the left have long assumed a set of givens in the United States. There will and should be ample continuing and enthusiastic policy disagreement in this constitutional democracy. We argue relentlessly as we should about the budget and taxes and spending levels and economic rights and subsidies and infrastructure and environmental issues, climate change, regulatory burdens, teacher salaries, labor issues, commercial development, and more. The list is literally endless and it's evolving. On all these fronts, we propose, debate, lobby, form coalitions, hustle and embrace the tools of politics, recognizing it that in the end, the majority's preferences will prevail. But constitutionalists also necessarily have assumed that on an array of other fronts, we agree. These are the foundations of constitutional democracy, its fundaments. They are, in essence, the rules of the road that allow democracy to actually function. Often they're clear and robust, even textual mandates like the right to vote, the right to speak, freedom of the press, the right to assemble and protest and organize, the right to free and unhindered elections, the right to fair representation. You know the list. It takes no great perceptiveness to see that on some level, some such rules have to be developed and enforced if the democratic venture is to endure. It's not unlike the rules in a town hall meeting, giving everyone an equal shot at the microphone, lest the undertaking no longer actually be a meeting of the town. And often these foundational rules are softer, more fluid and malleable rules like separation of powers and checks and balances and federalism and local government prerogatives, something you know about in Asheville, academic independence and governance and deference to organizations of civil society. These are all methods of ensuring that a robust and balanced democratic society has breathing room to function. These guardrail norms, hard and soft, are the givens, the shared commitments of constitutional democracy. And our general framework, we've thought, is that we all agree on these pathways as we fight about almost everything else. In fact, it's that agreement that allows, it, allows us to effectively disagree and fight on all these other fronts. When you lose the election to control the state house, for example, 
You don't burn down the legislative building on your last day in office. You go home, gather yourself, regroup, organize, learn from your mistakes, and try again next time. Well, over the last decade in North Carolina, we've learned that these shared commitments to foundational standards are decidedly weaker than constitutional stalwarts might have assumed. The mistake was an understandable one because these are, broadly speaking, the norms that we pledge allegiance to, that we fight our wars over, that we sing our hymns about and recite, hopefully, to our children, that we attest to as providing the mission and meaning of our nation. In fact, though, they've turned out to be weaker, less durable, less uh, robust, more willingly transgressed than I or maybe many others have presumed. If one was inclined to be generous, which I'm not always, it could be said that sometimes these breaches may have come from what could be labeled as inexperience or exuberance arising from the assumption of newly acquired powers. I think a lot of the General Assembly's moves to run roughshod over institutions like the academy or even the judiciary reflect this a little bit. The most frequent refrain, refrain that I heard in my run-ins with the Republican lawmakers and trustees was that I better learn that there's a new sheriff in town. I better get that through my head if I knew what was good for me. And I better join the posse. That the folks who sign your paychecks will tell you what to say and when to say it. Such is just the way of the world, the theory goes. Even if an actual university, or more importantly, an impartial court of law couldn't possibly operate in that fashion. But much of the North Carolina crusade against democracy comes from highly informed and experienced sources. North Carolina Senate President Pro Tem Phil Berger and North Carolina Speaker of the House Tim Moore are knowledgeable senior lawyers. They are the principal architects of the overarching assault. Their staffing henchmen are effective and expert. The Republican redistricting and Vote regulation leaders of both chambers have been over the decades among the world's leading manipulators of the political process. They knew precisely the impact that the denials of equality they strove to inflict would have. That's explicitly what they were after. In addition, these folks are heavy participants in national Republican networks that are out to thwart majority rule. When these leaders, seasoned and otherwise, have come to accept and even cheer on the destruction of traditional constitutional guardrails, the underlying preconditions of democratic government have been dramatically damaged, and that's happened in North Carolina. That's tough news for any constitutional lawyer or any citizen, but it's true. Second, Democratic Party opposition to an all-out battle for democracy, which we now face, has often proven incapable of embracing the urgency, the resolve, the will, and the steel-driven strength to meet this literally existential challenge of today. Perhaps Democrats have waged politics in a defensive posture for so long, fretting to show that above all, they aren't as bad as the Republicans, that we've lost some of the power of leadership. After all, a watered down Republican agenda is still a Republican agenda. And the claim that one is a weaker, paler, softer version of one's adversaries hardly spurs others to take the hill. But democratic standard bearers here and across the country have often failed to behave as if they understood that the American experiment now actually hangs in the balance. Or here in North Carolina, they perhaps assume someone else will step in and save us. Maybe it'll be the Moral Monday movement or the Southern Coalition for Social Justice or the Black Lives Matter folks or the ACLU or 
common cause. These things will work out, all facts to the contrary. Third, and finally, it's now clear that the courts aren't going to save us, not in Washington, not in Raleigh. A half century of mostly Republican Supreme Court appointments at the national level has promised disingenuously justices who would play honest referee, who would honor precedent and be guided closely by the text and history of the Constitution. But instead, the most activist, partisan, and deeply ideological court in American history has now been launched. Its legacy aimed at privileging wealth, right-wing Christianity, and white ascendancy over democracy and equality. The unknown at this point is just how much damage they're gonna be allowed to inflict on the American experiment before they are one way or another dismantled. In the past decade, North Carolina has benefited a good deal from the remnant protections of independent federal judicial review. But in the final analysis, all federal judges will be required to bend the knee to the United States Supreme Court. And that means they'll have no future constructed role in the cause of justice. So we could be well reminded tonight of Ulysses Grant's quote a century and a half ago. There are but two parties now, traitors and patriots. I'm not certain that most North Carolinians recognize their democracy is seriously in peril. Most are reluctant to conclude that an array of their leaders is out to end the American political experiment. But as in the 19th century, North Carolina now has a massive group among us, powerfully positioned, who are willing to throw over democracy in order to ensure their own ascendancy, their own permanent ascendancy. With a dominant political party committed to autocracy, we're treading new ground, at least new ground in modern times. Many of our leaders here and across the country have proven themselves unfit to govern, unfit to be trusted with moral and political leadership. The sad truth is that's not gonna change. They have shown their surprising stripes. We've gotta be clear on that in our own heads. There's no unity to be had with people who don't believe in the American promise. There's no compromise to be had with authoritarianism. Meeting seditionists halfway only makes one complicit in the war against democracy. And the pro-democratic forces in this defining struggle can't be the gentle ones, the sweet and civil opposition. The stakes are just too high. Our foundational commitments are literally put into play right before our eyes. As Heather Cox Richardson has written, this is not the only story from today, but it's the only story that historians will note from this era. Did Americans defend their democracy? Frederick Douglass offered eloquent and inspiring direction for such times, referring unsurprisingly to the launching of the Declaration of Independence. He said, I would call to mind its sublime and glorious truth. Its mission was the redemption of the world from the bondage of the ages. Put away your race prejudice. Banish the idea that one class must rule over another. Recognize the fact that the rights of the humblest citizen are as worthy of protection as are those of the highest, and your problem will be solved. Your republic will stand and flourish forever. Nor was Douglas unclear about the necessary tone. It is not the light that is needed, he said, but the fire. It's not the gentle shower, but the thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind. We need the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. 
the hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. The South has always been a pivotal place in American struggles for equality. As my friend from the Moral Monday movement, Roz Pellis has put it, the South is where change needs to happen the most. It's also been a place that has catalyzed change. The two are connected. Reverend Barber has echoed this claim in different language. If you're gonna change the nation, you gotta change the South. And if you're gonna change the South, you gotta focus on these legislatures. Or as my new colleague in Chapel Hill, Cressy Cotton would have it. I keep my eyes on the South for a lot of reasons. This is my home. It is the region of the nation's original sin. Nothing about the future of this country can be resolved unless it is first resolved here. Not the climate crisis or the border or life expectancy or poverty, unless you, sol you solve it in the South and with the people of the South, you won't prevail. These last words, these last years have been unnerving for us. We've been somewhat undone. People like Trump and his North Carolina consigliere, Mark Meadows, and your former fellow, Madison Cawthorn, and your neighbor over there, Virginia Fox, and a ton of their cruel acolytes across the land. They've exuded a venom that threatens to engulf us all. They almost convince us by accretion that there's no honor in being human. There's no character, no morality, no courage, no obligation, no duty, no integrity, no idealism, no meaning, no love, no habit of heart. There is only the more powerful crushing, the less advantaged only the villain stalking his prey. But even as an old man, I'm confident that these loathsome types cannot prevail. I see their demise in these powerful people-based movements, these green shoots, these glorious eruptions in Kansas, in Wisconsin, in Nashville, in Montana of all places. And over and over again, as you know, on the streets of Raleigh, it is singular and crucial work that we are in. Deeply diverse societies often founder, brutalizing their most vulnerable in ways that demolish the humanity of all. But no decent person can long for or abide that fate. So this is tough work, the toughest. Now the United States and North Carolina's defining attestations are put inescapably and completely to the metal. Many apparently would bolt from these historic demands, insisting on privilege rather than long declared and defining principle. But not all of us, not even most of us. And the mission, it turns out, is of the highest order. We learn here slowly, grudgingly, but finally, that we can't be only the heirs of freedom. We must also be its guarantors. We can't claim liberty's gift without also assuming its obligation. We've come to understand, even if reluctantly, that democracy is never a final achievement. It is a call to unending struggle. We believe with Dr. King that the arc of the moral universe does indeed bend towards justice, but we understand that that's the case only if we ourselves do the bending. And most crucially, we utterly refuse to give up on the idea of an America for all, even when it hangs frighteningly in the balance, especially when it hangs frighteningly in the balance. Patricia, I think maybe we could uh, open it up for questions. Um, that's uh, uh, the kind of the full introduction I wanted to offer anyway, and I look forward to discussions. All right, well, 
That was a fantastic and rousing read, Jean. I want to thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure our audience is uh, really inspired. That was a, a great call to action. Let me pose, if I may, please, some of their questions to you. Uh, this is from Mandy Ann. And uh, Mandy Ann asks, I was wondering if the book has some hopeful news, and you were ending on a on a hopeful note for sure. But what is some information helpful for change? And yes, especially so after last night. After last night, uh, Mandy, it's a great question, and there is some uh, hopeful news in here. Uh, though I got to admit, it's thin. Uh, so, and I don't. I'm not, I'm not trying to overpromise. I do think there's a there's a, a purpose in this depiction, which is, in my judgment, it's crucial for folks to realize the difficulty of the situation that we're in. I think most of us don't. There, there are understandable reasons for that. Most people don't want to pay attention to politics all the time. They don't want to think that uh, things are as bad as some hysterical folks uh, might claim. Uh, even when they actually are, even when the threat is as potent as it is. And so as a, as a general matter, uh, I think it's, fair, it's required of us that we look it in the face, that we not turn away from it. It is what it is, a war against the American democracy. And we are now old hands at it in North Carolina. Uh, and that's not all... Uh, great and optimistic story. But it, here's the way I would describe uh, the, my basis for hope. And I, I'll try not to go on too long here. I'm a constitutional lawyer by trade and I've uh, been involved in uh, many sort of skirmishes uh, over the years. Uh, the, you know, what I would say for, is that the, the locus of my hope as an old man has changed. Um, I, I became a lawyer as a pup uh, uh, at the time that we had the Warren Court or just after the Warren Court. I believe like everybody in my law school classes did that this was the way to uh, make a mark for equality and liberty in the United States through the legal system. Uh, and uh, at various times in my long career, that's there's been some truth in that. Uh, at various and long intervals, there has not. And there decidedly is not this day. Uh, the United States Supreme Court has become captured for a long period of time. Um, I think it's horrifying how that's happened. And I think we ought to all uh, find ways to fight back against it. But uh, we can't expect that the federal courts are going to save us. We got... Uh, very powerful notice only three weeks ago that the North Carolina Supreme Court is going to be join the battle uh, against uh, democracy, and they're going to do it with full ver fervor, acting as a caucus of the Republican Party. I, uh, I, I've been involved, like a lot of you have, in movement politics in North Carolina. I've, I've sometimes been disappointed that it seemed to me like something I'm also much involved in, democratic, traditional democratic politics, partisan politics, has not always been strong enough to take advantage of the power of movement politics in North Carolina. So I'm a little less confident in the traditional incrementalist give and take of democratic politics. Um, I'm still hopeful, but uh, it's hard to Place that as your principal source of optimism. My, my locus for optimism comes from what I think of now as an old man in engaged citizens, um, uh, movement sort of politics, people-based politics with a great sense of urgency. Now, I know that sounds wacky or... Uh, uh, too ethereal. Let, but let me just point out a few things. Um, things like the great uh, abortion election in Kansas, uh, where uh, uh, 
uh, everyone, all politicians, all legal scholars thought that there was no chance that the people of Kansas were going to weigh in uh, in favor of abortion rights. It was hardly like Kansas. But not only did they weigh in, they weighed in by great margins. There were tons of women, young women, uh, who defied all expectations. If you would ask any Republican in Kansas whether that could have happened, they would have said no. But I'm also telling you, if you ask any Democratic consultant in Kansas if that could have happened, they would have said no too. But the people of Kansas didn't, especially the young women of Kansas who said, we're not going to allow this. It's not going to happen again on our watch. The same thing happened with the, the recent Wisconsin Supreme Court uh, election, where you had a Supreme Court justice candidate, lo and behold, uh, uh, who was uh, uh, running explicitly on abortion rights and on working to save this democracy. Uh, she was joined by all kinds of young people, particularly all kinds of women outside the traditional political process. And uh, even though uh, Wisconsin is this split state where if you looked at the numbers, um, four of the last six presidential elections have been decided by less than 1%. Not only did this uh, uh, woman uh, justice, uh, the overt progressive win, but she won by 11 points uh, in a shocking uh, result. Uh, and then everybody here, everybody on the Zoom was greatly affected by these, uh, particularly those two young black legislators in Tennessee. Uh, standing up, teaching us what it means to be an American, what it means to be a leader, uh, uh, making the sort of old crows who were surrounding them in the state house uh, in Tennessee uh, look anachronistic, look like they were from another century, which uh, they were. And uh, I, I, I'm, to me, uh, uh, creating a great sense of enthusiasm for the future. You you probably saw this uh, great uh, uh, transgender woman uh, legislator in Montana who stood up and stared down her colleagues. Now she got censured, but that was like trying to censure the 21st century. It's just not going to work. Uh, and we've seen a lot of that in North Carolina. Uh, I wish we could see more. There's been a as you know, a recommitment uh, in recent weeks of the Moral Monday movement, and I think it's going to be strong and potent. I'm going to say one other example of this, because I know uh, this sounds ethereal or pie in the sky. I think of Joe Biden's election over Donald Trump in these terms. Um, uh, I've, I've never been the greatest Joe Biden fan. Uh, but I feel like we owe him the greatest debt ever uh, accumulated in the United States by uh, defeating uh, Donald Trump. Uh, I worry a little bit, though, that sometimes he or his consultants think that he's the one who defeated Donald Trump. Uh, in some ways, I thought it was telling that, you know, no one, we didn't have a, a sort of charismatic candidate. I've never known anyone who was enthusiastic about uh Joe Biden. I mean, a lot of people supported him and worked their asses off for him, but uh, no one sort of comes to, you know, no one's going to confuse Joe Biden with Barack uh, Obama. Who did win that? It seems to me were engaged citizens all over the country. Um, some old, uh, <laughs> I love the these folks who uh, manned the uh, electoral stations and uh, sort of said, we're going to do this. I've got it. Hold my beer. <laughs> uh, uh, the great engaged Black women all across uh, the United States, young people pouring into the polling places in droves. That's what won the Biden presidency. And I think it, it won on this premise. That is, we are not willing to give up on the American democracy. By God, we're going to protect it. We're going to play our role. It's a long, long answer, and I apologize, Mandy. But that's this the that's the source. 
that I have confidence in, that I believe will save democracy in North Carolina and save it in the United States. And I promise I'll never again give such a long answer to a question. All right, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> Gene, thank you yeah, so much. <laughs> we'll see. We'll right. see. I feel like that might have been your opening argument. Uh, <laughs> as someone who's in, who's so steeped in constitutional law, who has, you know, like you mentioned, had some skirmishes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you really must be a believer in the the system, the the idea of the Constitution as something that we must engage with interpret, fight for, demand accountability uh, of our elected representatives, but also demand accountability of ourselves. No matter what age we are, you know, we're, we're, we, this, is, this is what we have. So as a constitutional lawyer, how do you see the recent, and by recent, uh, that's maybe like in longer years, the last decade. What are we looking at if we want to try to understand, or maybe it's short or maybe it's longer, not just in a kind of a partisan way, but what are the trends? What are we looking at in terms of the health of the democracy and the const and the rulings coming coming from the Supreme Court? Uh, Patricia, let me first say, uh, let me plead guilty to all those things you said about me. And uh, I'm sort of... Um, hopelessly committed to the American experiment. Um, it's, this, this is odd, but uh, when, when I became a lawyer, when I went to law school, I, I came from a family where no one had ever gone to college or anything. And um, I, I'd been a football player in college and oddly a philosophy major. Uh, they told me that they'd never had such a combination before. And when I went to law school, I wasn't sure that I thought it was worth doing. I thought it was the life unexamined in the first semester when we had property contracts and torts and the like. Um, but in the second semester, we had constitutional law and we were introduced to the American aspirations of liberty and equality. The foundational notion is what Jefferson wrote up, even if he didn't always live, live it out. It's what Lincoln rededicated us to. It's what King sought uh, in a second uh, uh, revolution. And I've been stuck in that happy commitment uh, my whole life. I'm, I'm just, I've been lucky that I found something that I really believed in that I wanted to work on. And I've done a whole lot of different things. I've been a, I uh, was a trial lawyer. I've been a, a uh, law school dean, uh, university president. I've, I've done a bunch of different things, but in my own odd head, I always thought I was being an equality lawyer. That's what I was doing. I was working on questions of equality. If that's your worldview, then there have been times in which that move has been greatly energized, and there have been times when it's greatly threatened. And this and that's sort of the point of this. This is, I think, the greatest time of threat since the Civil War. I'm, I'm not sure that most of us understand that, but I uh, believe it to be so. Um, and therefore, uh, I think it's all hands on deck. The American experiment is a remarkable thing. Uh, we've had a uh, an inspiring, but also a brutal and horrifying history. But the best way of looking at the American experiment is the gradual, grudging, much too slow, much too bloody, much too demanding of sacrifice, unfolding of that promise of equality to larger and larger groups of folk. And now what we face, I think, Patricia, is a belief, not the first time in our history, a belief by a lot of folks that they're about to be outnumbered, that uh, 
pluralistic democracy is going to overcome their traditional privilege. And we're seeing that play out all over the United States. It's playing Thank out dramatically. In Do North you see that in some Supreme Court rulings or some trends that you can point to that uh, yeah, help us a, kind of take a broad me, look? To me, it's the, the, the principal reason for all these efforts at voter suppression, at electoral suppression, at cheating at politics in a way that uh, keeps the, the ends in power without a fair chance of being challenged is that uh, the, the sources of traditional power, uh, white, propertied, Christian, largely male folks, uh, see the handwriting on the wall and they're losing their authority. They are no longer in a majority in many parts of the country. And even in others like here, the days are not long for that uh, authority. So they're looking for ways to assure their power regardless. And if it means you have to dump democracy to do it, uh, they're all inclined for that. That's happening in North Carolina markedly. It's happening with the white people's politics. It's happening with an evangelical white Christian religious politics, which is not the majority of us, but which is damned determined that they're going to inflict that uh, set of uh, beliefs, um, unchristian ones, I think, uh, on all the rest of us, even though they're not in the majority. And that's why we've seen unfold in North Carolina what I describe as kind of a central thesis here. That is the notion that some people count and others don't. Uh, some people count more than others. There are the real Americans, the white, largely male Christian Americans, and they're meant to prevail no matter what democratic theory would suggest. Uh, and if that means they got to cheat or dump the idea of democracy to do it, just like was the case in the Civil War. Uh, if the only way we can uh, assure our own ascendancy is to dump democracy, then we're all for it. Despite all the sacrifice. I mean, I just, sometimes I think, think of those World War II folks and what they thought they were fighting for. Uh, and you people want to dump democracy and you claim you're a patriot and a Christian when you're doing it. What a bunch Wait, of you've, you've raised uh, an important word and it's patriotism. And, and something else that you mentioned earlier was cynicism. Mm. So sometimes people's loss of hope congeals mm. into a kind of cynicism. And, that, that, and one of the questions, that, and you answered it um, earlier in a different way, but people sometimes feel like they, they can lose hope or they just want to say, Oh, they're all crooks. Oh, there's the whole thing is hopeless. But you seem to suggest that there's something worth saving. And not only that, there's something worth being loyal to, mm -hmm. that there's a loyalty to something, these ideals or the country. How do you how do you square that with the the cynicism or the hopelessness Uh What's a, a, what's a concrete example that you can that's a great, give? That's a great uh, question uh, and a, a persistent one for me in my own head. Uh, and uh, it's, it's magnified in my case because I'm a teacher. I'm around young people all the time who sort of by DNA carry hope, but they worry that it's misplaced uh, and that it's, um, that it's overcome by cynicism. And so this is something they want to talk about. I think about it a good bit. He, he, let me explain kind of my own journey on this, which, oh, I hate that word, uh, my own history. Um, when I was younger, when people asked me about hope, I would say uh, this with Dr. King, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's a statement of hope, a statement that you're, 
going to be better. I'm obsessed with a woman named Fannie Lou Hamer. And Mrs. Hamer used to say, first of all, that like I've said, <laughs> I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. But she also said, if I fall, I'm falling five feet, four inches forward for freedom. Uh, to me, that was a powerful statement of hope and the belief that ultimately these values will prevail. Now, I'm old now. I just turned 72 the other day. Uh, and I've had a lot of, like you said, Patricia, there have been a lot of battles, a few won, a lot lost. Uh, and it's not as easy to carry that version of hope with me every day. Um, so now I tell people, well, I carry that version of hope, Mrs. Hamer and Dr. King, about two or three days a week. <laughs> the other, uh, the, the seven days, I carry a different definition of hope, which comes from the remarkable Czech poet and president Václav Havel. Havel said this, he said, hope is not a description of the world around us. It's not a prognosis or a prediction of the future. It is a predisposition of the spirit, um, a habit of the heart. It's, I expand on it a little bit, it's the conscious choice to live in the belief that we can make a difference in the quality of our shared and sometimes threatened lives. It is in that sense, the nobler of contested hypotheses. I'm not saying I can prove it, but it's the nobler way to live. And I, I've had some lucky things in my life along with some kind of disastrous ones. One is I got to know and was sort of friendly with uh, Molly Ivins. And I remember uh, having long discussions with her about this. And she would talk about her long struggles and the, the wins and the losses and uh, some of her friends. And she'd say, but, you know, when you think about it, hasn't it been fun? Isn't this, this is my view, isn't living in hope a more admirable choice than its opposite? And so what I say to young students is, Maybe three days a week, I've got the sense of hope that Dr. King carried around. But seven days a week, I've always got Havel's hope, that having hope in this worthy cause is better than being cynical about it. It's a better, more pleasant, more uplifting way to live. And I don't know if Dr. King's prediction is right. I hope it is. Sometimes I think it is. But I'm pretty damn certain that Havel's prescription is correct. So that's enough for me anyway. You know, when you mention uh, Havel, I also, of course, think of um, Anne Applebaum mm -hmm. and uh, The Twilight of Democracy, the book she wrote. Uh, you know, she's connected to Poland and has written a lot. And she's not a, she certainly wouldn't categorize herself as a liberal. Nope. But she's a moderate conservative of the European bent and writes very compelling and in a very compelling way about the the kind of the the global context for the threats to democracy that she sees. And your book seems to fit very nicely in with a a larger kind of a, a canary in the coal mine, if I can use that that mm -hmm. metaphor. So uh, we're getting to the top of the hour, but I wonder, you know, we've talked, uh, I, I find you speak very compellingly about optimism um, and also figures who embodied that optimism and inspired millions of people, uh, hundreds of millions of people. What, what, would, what would you say we shouldn't do? Like, what's an example of a, this strategy hasn't worked. So hope works, a version of hope works, uh, joining a noble cause, calling upon your better instincts as a human being, as a moral person, that works, uh, fighting for justice. 
But our, our folks out there, the, when I say the royal we, in a way, in a kind of a wink, wink, what do mm-hmm. we, what maybe have we, would we need to redirect? Where, where could we say, don't put your energy in that anymore. Try this instead. Well, here's my view on that. And it, it relates to your preface too. Let me, I love that you talked about Ann Appleby and uh, Applebaum and, um, uh, I, if you would ask me um, 15 years ago if I thought I would become an acolyte of hers, I would have said no. But I read everything uh, she yeah. writes uh, with uh, rapt uh, attention. And uh, I think that she is powerful and almost singular in describing the threats which exist not only in the United States, but uh, across the globe to democracy. She's uh, you wouldn't call her um, rosy or uh, um, un, un, uh, well, she's not censored about it. She's not uh, giddy, um, but uh, she believes, and I think she's desperately correct in describing what we face and she does it better than anyone. I also think this, If you asked her, is this worth it? Is it worth this fight? Even if she's not the rosiest of predictors, I can't think of anyone who would more powerfully say, yes, the struggle is everything. And uh, I think uh, she's a great tonic, really, in that way. As, As far as what I wish we would do differently, maybe it's it's related to that. Uh, I wish we would see how crucial the stakes are. I wish we would look that in the face. And if we did, recognizing what we've invested, what it means for our kids, we would treat it as the most important challenge that we face as a people. We wouldn't think about it once every 14th Sunday or something like that. We wouldn't think we met our obligations if we happened to go vote in the general election. Uh, We would see it as a great surpassing challenge, which it is. And we would dedicate the energies essential to that. We also wouldn't say, given what's at stake, the, the American promise, that, well, my goal as a politician is just to be a little less ruthless than these Republicans are being. Uh, That wouldn't be our goal. Our our goal would be to fight for this marvel, the American experiment and its promise. To be, I know it's hokey to say it, patriotic in this cause, because this is the real patriotism, it seems to me. Casting your lot in favor of the American promise. Uh, I, I believe that we will still do that but it requires a much uh, more powerful focus than we've managed to give. And it's not going to be accomplished by people who are too busy to pay attention. Well, Gene Nichols, I can't think of a better note to end on. And I want to thank you so much for your latest contribution to, to our country and to all the communities that comprise it. I hope uh, everyone is listening and that they share this video far and wide because it's going to be available on Malaprop's YouTube channel for you to view. And if you have this link uh, audience, you can go back and watch it again and be inspired by Gene Nichols once again, because he's clearly very inspiring. And his book that he read from so so well and so movingly lessons from north carolina race religion tribe and the future of america gene it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you this evening and i want to thank you for sharing your time through malaprops with our audiences this evening thank you all audience have a great evening thank you very much it's an honor to be here thanks